entered into politics and public service. He's a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania Wharton School of Finance and followed in his father's footsteps into the world of real estate development, making his mark in this great city. He is also the author of 14 bestsellers and his first book, The Art of the Deal, is considered a business classic. Mr. Trump announced his candidacy for president June 2015, and one year later became the Republican nominee, clearing the field of 17 Republican candidates during those primaries, and won the presidency in his first run ever for political office. Following the president's address, we will have questions and answers from uh, two distinguished questioners. As a reminder to everyone, this conversation is on the record. It is being carried live. So if everyone could please turn their phones to silent. Mr. President, the podium is yours, sir. Thank you very much, Barbara. It's so sad that this is live. She said it's live. Oh, it's always live. There's always somebody with a phone. It becomes live. Ask a lot of politicians that are no longer in politics. I want to thank Marie Jose Gravis for your incredible leadership of the club. It's an honor to be here. It is wonderful also to be back in New York with so many friends and distinguished leaders, business and finance, academia, and I have to add, in real estate, all my real estate friends are here. I'm especially grateful for and to your longtime club members, because uh, it's a club with a tremendous reputation and uh, somebody doing an absolutely incredible job as director of the National Economic Council, a friend of mine who I got on. I've been hearing this voice for 35 years. It's driving me crazy. Larry Cutlow. <laughs> always calm, always cool, and uh, he's just Larry. And he's terrific, I'll tell you that. Three years ago, I came to speak before this storied forum as a candidate for president. And at that time, America was stuck in a failed recovery and saddled with a bleak economic future, and it was bleak. Under the last administration, nearly 200,000 manufacturing jobs had been lost. Almost 5 million more Americans had left the labor force. And jobs were not exactly what you would call plentiful. And 10 million people had been added to the food stamp rolls. In 2016, the Department of Labor predicted that Americans would continue dropping out of the workforce in record numbers. They predicted and projected a decade of sluggish growth, and they expected unemployment over 5 percent, and really 6, 7, and even, in some cases, 8 percent for years to come. The so-called experts said the Americans had no choice but to accept stagnation, decay, and a shrinking middle class as the new normal that was said all the time. In short, the American people were told to sit back and accept a slow, inevitable decline. But I never believed for one moment that our magnificent nation was destined for a diminished future. I knew that our destiny was in our own hands that we could choose to reject a future of America and really look at a future of American decline unacceptable and to build a future of American dominance, which is what I wanted. It couldn't be any other way. Or I would have never done this. I refused to accept that Americans had to lower their expectations or give up on their dreams. America is the single greatest country in the world, and I knew that working together, we could make it even greater. In 2016, I stood before you 
supremely confident in what our people could achieve if government stopped punishing American workers and started promoting American workers and American companies. Our middle class was being crushed under the weight of a punitive tax code, oppressive regulations, one-sided trade deals, and an economic policy that put America's interest last, and a very deep last at that. I knew that if we lifted these burdens from our economy and unleashed our people to pursue their ambitions and realize their limitless potential, then economic prosperity would come thundering back to our country at a record speed. That's what's happening. Today, I'm proud to stand before you as President of the United States to report that we have delivered on our promises and exceeded our expectations by a very wide margin. We have ended Waiting for that. Thank you. I was waiting for that. <laughs> I almost didn't get it. We have ended the war on American workers. We have stopped the assault on American industry. And we have launched an economic boom, the likes of which we have never seen before. I did this despite a near record number of rate increases and quantitative tightening by the Federal Reserve since I won the election. Eight increases in total, which were, in my opinion, far too fast an increase and far too slow a decrease. Because remember, we are actively competing with nations who openly cut interest rates so that now many are actually getting paid when they pay off their loan, known as negative interest. Who ever heard of such a thing? Give me some of that. <laughs> Give me some of that money. I want some of that money. Our Federal Reserve doesn't let us do it. I don't say thank you, thank you. The smart people are clapping. <laughs> Only the smart people are clapping. I don't say that's good for the world. I'm not president of the world. I'm president of our country. But we are competing against these other countries, nonetheless. And the Federal Reserve doesn't let us play at that game. It puts us at a competitive disadvantage to other countries. Yet, in the face of this reality, our economic policies have ushered in an unprecedented tide of prosperity surging all throughout the nation. We're paying interest by other Comparisons, we're paying actually high interest. We should be paying by far the lowest interest, and yet we're doing better than any nation by far on Earth. The extraordinary numbers tell the story. Back in 2016, before I took office, the Congressional Budget Office projected that fewer than 2 million jobs would be created by this time in 2019. Instead, my administration has created nearly 7 million jobs and going up rapidly. We beat predictions. Thank you. We beat predictions by more than three times the highest estimate that I saw during the campaign. Nobody thought it was even possible to get close to a 7 million number. 2 million was maxed out if you were lucky and if you did a great job. Unemployment has recently achieved the lowest rate in 51 years. African-American unemployment, Hispanic-American unemployment, and Asian-American unemployment have all reached the lowest rates in history. Women's unemployment, the best numbers in 71 years. We expect that that number of 71 years, which isn't good compared to the other numbers, is it? But women also will soon be historic we think. Blue-collar jobs are leading the way in our middle-class boom. We've added 25,000 mining jobs, 128,000 energy jobs, 1.2 million manufacturing and construction jobs, 
and manufacturing was supposed to be dead in our country, you would need, according to a past administration representative at the highest level of that past administration, you would need a magic wand to bring back manufacturing jobs. Well, we brought them back, and we brought them back to over 600,000 manufacturing jobs as of today. And those are very important jobs. Nearly 7 million people have been lifted off, very importantly, food stamps. 7 million people off of food stamps. And we're getting Americans off of welfare and back into the workforce. <laughs> Nearly 2.5 million Americans have risen out of poverty. That's a record. The rate of African American and Hispanic American families in poverty has plummeted to the lowest level ever recorded by far. Most of you people wouldn't know these numbers because most of you aren't very active in the market. But since my election, the S&P 500 is up over 45 percent. The Dow Jones is up over 50 percent. And the NASDAQ is up 60 percent, slightly more. And if we had a Federal Reserve that worked with us, you could have added another 25 percent to each one of those numbers. I guarantee you that. <laughs> that doesn't happen. But we all make mistakes, don't we? Not too often. We do make them on occasion. American markets have vastly outpaced the rest of the world. This exceptional growth is boosting 401ks, pensions, and college savings accounts for millions and millions of hardworking families. You hear so much about inequality and all of the differences and all of the problems. The single biggest benefactors of what we've done are middle-class workers and low-income families. It's been amazing, actually. Altogether, we've added nearly $10 trillion of new value to our economy. And that's in a short period of time. Remember, I only use numbers from the time of the election because I can't go to January 20th. It's not fair. We picked up tremendous stock market and economic numbers. They actually went wild the day after I won. I think that should be attributed to us, not attributed to somebody else, because it would have gone in the opposite direction. It would have gone in the opposite direction had the other result taken place, which, fortunately, it didn't. Last year, GDP growth matched the fastest rate in more than a decade, and it was the best of the G7 countries by far, by far. Perhaps most importantly, after years of stagnation and decline, American wages, salaries, and incomes are rising very fast. Median household income is now at the highest level in the history of our country. The average median income under President Bush rose only $400 over an eight-year period. Under President Obama, it rose $975 over an eight-year period. And under my administration, it rose $5,000 over slightly more than just two and a half years. That's a big difference. And if you remember, President Obama was paying 0 percent interest for a long period of time, while we're paying a much higher rate of interest. But in addition to the $5,000, we have to add $2,200 for the tax cuts, average tax cuts, and $2,000 to $3,000 for regulatory and energy cuts. So that would be a total of almost $10,000 versus $400 and versus $975. So that's something. So you have over eight years, you have $400. Over eight years, you have $975. Over two and a half years, 
We're almost up to three, but this was done and calculated only as of two and a half, and it's only gone up since then. We're at almost $10,000. So our consumers, because of this, are in the best shape probably in the history of our country. And I think it's going to be very long-lasting, very, very long-lasting. This also allows me the latitude and timing to take some of the horrible, incompetent, just terrible trade deals that have been made over the years and make them great. It's like, make America great again, make the tra trade deals great. I don't know if I can use the word again. Make them great, period, because I don't think they were ever any good. <laughs> Haven't seen it. We were great, and then we weren't so great, but we're great again. And by the way, on jobs, uh, just now, I'm glad this is today, because just now, they just announced we have the highest number of people working in our country, in the history of our country, almost 160 million people. We've never been close to that number. So we've achieved this stunning turnaround because we've adopted a new economic policy that finally puts America first. As President, I understand and embrace the fact that the world is a place of fierce competition. We're competing against other nations for jobs and industry growth and prosperity. Factories and businesses will always find a home. It's up to us to decide whether that home will be in a foreign country or right here in our country, our beloved USA, and that's where we want them to stay and be and move to. If we want our families and communities to prosper, America must be the best place on Earth to work, invest, innovate, build, pursue a career, hone a craft, or start a business. We want companies to move to America, stay in America, and hire American workers. My mission is to put our country on the very best footing to thrive, excel, compete, and to win. For many years, our leaders in Washington did the exact opposite. They imposed the highest corporate tax rates in the developed world, so high that people couldn't even understand what they were doing, and they would leave. Very, very smart executives didn't want to leave, but they would leave, sending our jobs and everything else all a flutter. They waged an unethical regulatory assault on the American people. They tried to shut down American energy. And by the way, they're still trying. You want to see energy shut down? Take a look at what I'm competing against on the other side. I don't think they even believe in energy. So far, I haven't found any form of energy that's acceptable to them. I think they think the factories are just going to work without energy, don't they? <laughs> they don't have a clue, these people. But I don't want to mention it yet. I want to wait a little bit longer. Let them go a little bit further so they can't take it back. Because as a campaign, I like it. I like it very much. Let them keep talking. Every time they talk, I say, boy, this looks like it might be easier than I anticipated. <laughs> they passed the disastrous trade deals that encouraged the shuttering of American plants and the offshoring of American jobs by the millions. In short, the failed political class sold out American workers, sold out American prosperity and sold out the American dream. This was the alarming situation I was elected to end. And ending it's never that easy. You see that. You do have people that want to keep it going that way, but they're losing, and they're losing now rapidly and fast. Those days are gone, and we're not going back. As you know, one of the key insights of economics is the power of incentives. Unlike past leaders, my goal is to ensure that this power works for America's favor and for America's workers and for America's companies. We want the incentives created by our tax, trade, regulatory, and energy policies to be pro-growth, pro-worker, 
and 100 percent pro-American, and more is yet to come. If we take back the House in 2020 and retain the Senate and the White House, you will see things that even this room, and you've experienced a lot of great times over the last two and a half years, but even you will be surprised to see. We have tremendous economic potential. We have tremendous potential. We have tremendous economic potential. At the heart of our economic revival is the biggest tax cut and reforms in American history. We provided massive relief for working families, saving $2,000 a year for a typical family of four. To bring jobs back, we lowered our business tax rate from the highest tax rate in the developed world down to a very competitive number, not quite the lowest, but getting close. And we may even be able to get there one day not too — in the not-too-distant future.